Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this caricaturized British Matilda infantry tank. The model that you see here is both my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box and will be going over many of the kit's features as well as what the base starter kit supplies you with by giving it a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the British Matilda Mark II heavy tank or also known as a infantry tank. But again, that's really semantics because that's not really what we have here, isn't it? This here is a caricaturized version of the famous British Matilda Mark II. This model here is actually a model kit from a video game known as World War Tunes. Which means, you guessed it, this video is part of the ECA channel's tradition of uploading World War Tunes caricature model tank videos on April Fool's Day. <laughs> World War Tunes is an online video game that takes place in a World War II setting. However, unlike the plethora of other World War II themed games, this one's fairly unique because of the art style. Rather than going with a ultra realistic type setting as which is common on many other games, World War Tunes goes on the opposite end and goes for a fun cartoony type art style and that is seen on all of the characters but more importantly it's seen on all the vehicles which would include planes as well as tanks. The game has been around for a little while now but one thing that's really cool about this particular game is that a number of years ago the game developer hooked up with Meng Plastic Model Company and they produce a range of licensed World War Tunes products in plastic kit form. The range includes a large number of infamous World War II tanks that have been all caricaturized in the following format that you see here. What's really cool about these models is that they have the look and feel of the real vehicle in question but are really fun with the outward appearance that the vehicle has with its outward proportions as well as dimensions. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Meng World War Tunes caricaturized British Matilda infantry tank. This model here is a relatively new addition to the collection. I went ahead and picked it up about six months ago off of eBay, and it's been sitting in the stash waiting for, well, this time of the year where I go ahead and build these models for your enjoyment on YouTube. These kits at the moment are still relatively easy to track down and are affordable when found. I picked up this one anywhere between 15 to 23 some odd US dollars. But these are the type of models as well as some of the other World War Tunes kits that you are not going to find generally in a store type setting. Like I've yet to see a kit like this in a store. The only ones I've ever seen on a store shelf in person were the Panther, the Tiger, and the Sherman, and I found those in Hobby Lobby. These ones though, these are generally something that you're going to track down online. So enough with that, let's go ahead and start with the model's box art. Here we have the box art in question, which I gotta say it's really nicely done. This one here we have the Matilda out in the desert, and as usual the illustrator did a good job with rendering out and intermixing fine detail renderings along with the caricaturized cartoonish nature of the subject matter. I really dig the desert paint scheme that I see on this and this is exactly the way I'm going to be building my example of this model. The remainder of the gravity designs, quite typical for the World War II's lineup. Here we have the two diagonal bars that come down across and of course, like I always point on these videos, this is done so if you put more than one of these kits together on a store shelf you have this cool continuous banner or you can use it to display your own models in your display shelf in your office or in your display setting cabinet where you have the box arts all lined up with the model in front of it you know you could do something like that anyway so besides all that information here we have the 
company logo, which is of course Meng. This is WWT-014. On this side here we have the World War Tunes logo in that gear motif, and here we have the title of the vehicle in question in that really cool cartoony typeface. On the side of the box here we have the type of layout which is quite typical for these World War Tunes models. Another example is this one right over here, which of course is the subject matter of its own model showcase video. On this side, we have a front and side profile of this model. Apparently, you have the option to build this in one of two ways. One is with the British pattern, and the other appears to be captured German. Here we have the logo for the game developer, along with some corporate information. Now, this is where the kits differ. On the older kits, the game developer was a, a company called Rookfan, but apparently at some point in time, they must have sold the rights or got acquired by this new company called Rescali. So that is something to point out. On the opposite side here, we would generally have a advert for some sort of paints, either from AK Interactive or on some of these recent ones that I have here from Meng themselves, but rather than that, we just have an advert for some of the other kits in the World War Tunes, and looks like they're spreading out to other characterized subject matters. We have the Sherman, the Persian, which as a side note, I actually built both of these models, and you can see them on the ECA channel, but here we have two other examples. One is a battleship of some sort, and the other is a Lancaster bomber. On the back portion of the box, we got here the Typical format that we've seen on all these World War Tunes models. Here we have the World War Tunes video game banner advert with some in game graphics of the vehicle in question. And here we go again with the captured German version of the Matilda. On this side here we have the Olga approved stamp and all the other corporate information that I've touched upon before. Of course, it's time to crack the box open. And just like with all the models, they are side opening, which is unique for tank kits. And just like with all the other World War II's models, they are self-contained in this giant bag. Also, just like with all the other World War II's models, these ones here are known to be ridiculously easy to put together, and they are simplistic, which is something that we'll be able to see once I dig into it. These models are made all out of injection molded styrene, or I should say just injection molded plastic in general. The only pieces that are not injection molded plastic are the tracks, which are flexible rubber, and the decal sheets, which are, well, worse like decals. They can't be made out of plastic, can they? So let's go ahead, open up the bag here, dump out the parts. All right, so this one contains two runners along with the upper hull molding. Starting with the upper hull itself, it is quite obviously a Matilda. And they did a really good job with getting the look and the feel of it. Appears we got some type of release agent here on the surface, just wiped right off, no problems. Just like with the other World War II's models, the quality of the molds are are excellently done. You know, Meng is a modern model company and they use modern technology to create their molds and you can see that here with the quality of the castings. Even though the subject matter is simplistic, the quality of the plastic moldings is still nicely done. You know, we have all those really cool hinge sections. I found these axis hatches here on the side portion of the Matilda. Bunch of rivets on the side. That roller type front hatch for the driver and also we have a stylized rear manifold layout for the engine deck. This runner here contains the components to assemble the sides and the hull of the model. Unlike the other ones where the hull was one piece, this one here it's a multi-piece assembly which again should be fairly easy to plug together. This is the bottom plate here. What's cool is it looks like they made the portion stick out from the side. On the Matilda the front here is a mosaic of thick cast components that are welded together and they went ahead and Gave you that bit of detailing, shows you they were really trying to get as much of the character of the Matilda as possible. We've got that giant fuel tank found on the back. A ton of wheels and a bunch of little plastic pegs that secure the wheels to the model. This is one of those things, guys, where if you're building this, you want to pay attention and not lose any of these because if you lose one, you're going to be basically up the creek without a paddle. So you want to keep that in mind. The side hull here has all the perforations for securing on the row wheels. And again, you know, it's quite typical from what I've seen from these other World War II models. One thing I do want to point out, we do have some fuel canisters, like I touched upon before, but these ones here 
are a two half assembly, which means there is going to be some seam work to contend with on this example. Some of the other World War II models I've built, the seam work was non-existent, while others you do have a seam or two here or there to worry about. But for this one here, this looks like the bulk of it. But again, we'll see how that pans out once I actually dig into it. This runner here contains all the components for the turret. So here we got the turret sides. I really dig the geometry here that they went with. It definitely looks like an old school Matilda, specifically if you're like, you mean you built the old Tamiya one. This is the bottom portion here. It's got these really wonky shapes to it. Again, it's it, it's a World War II's model, so it definitely does not disappoint. Here we got the turret roof, probably some other bulkhead for the turret structure. And uh, yeah, this one here, it's more akin to the Ferdinand with the way the turrets assembled and getting a lot of Ferdinand vibes from this, where you have a lot of sub-assemblies that puzzle fit together to give you the shape and the piece of the turret, which does mean, again, more seam work that you are going to have to worry about. We got the smoke grenade launchers right over here, which is cool because on the Firefly, I actually had to fabricate these out of bits of styrene, which was, which was fun. And we have some more exhaust components, hatches. The hatches on this one are really cool. It's nice and big. On some of the other World War II models, they're like really tiny in size. And we have the mantlet and the main barrel. The barrel is a single piece molding, which is the case on several of the later World War II models. And there is no hole here, but of course I'm going to probably take care of that. That's basically all there is for the turret, or I should say the runner itself. Here we have the tracks. The tracks are in great condition. And they are made out of the same flexible vinyl that's found on the other examples. They do have some really nice details molded in, albeit in a simplistic form, but the quality is still good nonetheless. The inside portion over here, we have some horizontal lines going across to simulate the, the track hinge. And from what I've seen on the other builds, these do tend to paint and weather very nicely. The decal sheet is just your typical water slide decals, and they're made with the same printing technology that Meng uses on the other kits that they release, and from what I've seen in the past, these decals always are good quality, so we'll see how that pans out. One quick thing I do want to point out, though, is that with the way the hull on this one is assembled, I'm getting very similar vibes to the Churchill, which I also did a video showcase on, and on that one I mentioned on this one, you're going to have to assemble the hull and the turret at the very tail end of the build because of the way the tracks need to be installed. Obviously, unlike some of the other vehicles out there where you could just slide the tracks on once the thing is fully built, with this one over here, obviously it's going to be a problem specifically since the tracks are a single rubber band bracelet type molding. This is the type of thing you're going to have to build the two pieces separately, install the tracks, and then once everything's painted and weathered, put the tracks on and do a final marriage of the components, but I'll touch upon more of that towards the latter half of the video. As for the instructions, quite typical for Meng. I'm, again, I really dig this box art. The, this is probably one of the my, the better ones that was done by this illustrator. Not saying the other ones are crap or anything, but this one, I don't know. I just, I, I dig the, the color scheme. The World War II's instructions are always really nicely done with the layout. Unlike most other kits out there where you just have some folded piece of paper with some CAD drawings, the World War II's layouts have more graphic design on them, which leads for better presentation. Also, the CAD work on the pieces themselves are very nicely illustrated, and because of that, this does aid with the simplicity of the model, and again, these models are known to be really easy to put together. There's the turret. Like I stated before, it's going to be a multi-part assembly, which means seam work. And here we have a color chart with the two options that you have. Here's the German capture, and here's the British variant with that cool British camo. And that's basically all there is to that. So, let's go ahead. I'm going to jump on this one, and let's hop to when this thing is fully finished. Okay, so I'm just going to come out and say it. Of all of the World War II tanks that I've built, and I think at this point I've built just about all of them, with the exception of one, this one here was by far the most tricky to assemble. Not hard, but tricky. I definitely have to step outside my comfort zone in order to get this one built, and I'm going to explain in a second. You see, on the other World War II's models, 
during the construction, basically the entire model is able to be built and then the suspension and the track get fitted at the tail end of the build. With the exception of, you know, one or two of them where I had to paint the sections in sub-assemblies and then secure them in place. Vehicles like the B1 Bis, the Swama, and the Churchill come to mind. Well, the Churchill was similar where, you know, we had a side like this, but with the Churchill, I was able to go ahead and paint everything and then assemble the upper and lower hulls after the fact when everything's fully painted and weathered. And that's something technically you can still do with this one, but you're going to run into an issue with the seam work. Unlike the Churchill where when the upper and lower hulls go together, the seams blend in with the paneling on that vehicle. On the Matilda here, not so much. With the Matilda, you'll have a nice seam running right across the bow portion here, and you'll have another seam well, it actually comes in, you don't really have a seam on the back. The one on the front's really the one that sticks out. So, going about it like I did on the Churchill was not going to be possible. And since the side panels are integrally molded to the upper, you're not going to be able to do it like the B1 Bis or the Soma. So this one here, I had to do a technique that I really haven't done before, but was one I had in storage just in case of this type of a situation. This model required the entire lower hull, the suspension and the track, to be built, painted, and assembled first, and then the remainder of the construction can resume. So basically what I did was, before I even touched the turret and the upper hull and anything along those lines, the entire lower portion, the wheels and the track, were fully painted and weathered. The wheels were secured to the vehicle after all the weathering work was concluded. And I even went ahead and varnished the lower inner portions here because while well, I was finishing another model, had the varnish on hand, why not use it? But on the wheels themselves, they are the same assembly as seen on the other World War II models where we have a stem that secures the thing in place. But like I often mention, they're a bit on the frailer side on this particular model. And with the tolerances being what they are, it would really help if you go up and down those surfaces with an exacto to loosen them up just so it aids with the assembly and you don't run the risk of potentially cracking one during the installation. That, that's not really beneficial for anyone. Anyway, so after the wheels were installed, the track was fully painted and weathered, mounted in place. At that time, I was then able to mount the upper to the lower hull. And mind you, at this time, the upper hull is not even painted or primed for that matter. Oh, during the painting process, the interior sections were also painted as well for a reason that should be fairly obvious. Anyway, so after the upper and lower hull sections were mounted in place, I went ahead completed the bodywork found on the front section, and resumed with the remainder of the build. Once the model got to the point where it was ready for painting, I went ahead and thoroughly masked up the exposed area of track and also the inside portion here of these vent holes. The holes were plugged up with some tissue paper and masking tape was used to seal off the track section keeping everything nice and carterized. From there, the model was able to go into its paint, camouflage, and the weathering. The paintwork, once completed, I was then able to remove the tape and the paper, leaving for the appearance that we have here. The tracks did suffer some paint chipping, however, this was touched up via the airbrush and some dry brushing, just so everything was able to be blended back in. Unlike the other World War II's models where the model can be pushed on the Matilda here, that's not really the case. One, I'm not going to do it anyway because I don't want to chip up the track. But even if I didn't, the tolerances of the way the track secures to the inside of the hull, this side section here kind of squeezes it in certain places. And because of that, you're not really going to be able to push this one across the rug. I mean, you could probably give it the old college try. It might work on you, but it's not going to be nearly as easily pushed compared to some of the other tanks in the World War II's lineup. I will say though that once the tape was removed, the model turned out to be absolutely perfect. I really was able to get the model built, painted, and weathered without there being any sort of collateral damage found on the tracks. I mean, I didn't even have a single overspray, so I'm lucky in that regard. 
Come to think of it, this is not really the only World War II tank that you may have that issue with. I believe on the Pershing, this is something that I potentially ran into, but I was able to avoid it by going with the modifications I touched upon in that video. One other vehicle that I would probably if I was to do again, I would do in the same format, would be the Porsche King Tiger. The King Tiger has those side skirts integrally molded on. Because of that, installing the suspension and the track was not easy at all. In fact, on mine, I actually broke the side skirt, and fortunately, I was able to fix it in a way that was completely seamless. But if I was to go through that build again, yeah, I, I would definitely do the technique that I used on the Matilda here. So after that really long-winded description of what happened here you get to see what the final outcome is and I will say that this tank came out to be absolutely perfect I'm really digging how this one turned out and I'm, like I'm going to probably touch upon towards the end of the video this here is probably one of my favorite World War II's builds so starting with the sides you get to see the detailing now all exposed with the paint and the weathering add and the weathering really does make the molding detailing stand out all that much more. Fortunately, this tank has a lot of it, so it's really appreciated on this build. On the bow section, you get to see what it looks like with the bodywork completed, or you don't see the bodywork, which is the idea, and it leads for a completely seamless look. The hooks and the lights are secured in place after the bodywork is concluded, and they just drop into place as they would on any other model. On the rear section here, we have the exhaust manifold, and this model here has one of the more advanced exhausts compared to any of the other World War II's models. The exhaust was also one of the reasons why I couldn't just do it like the Churchill, where I have the upper and lower hull get glued on, at, or I should say affixed to one another at the tail end, because with the way the exhaust system needs to funnel out from the hull, run along the top, and then make its way back again to the main exhaust drum. The piece, even though it is the more, the, I should say, the most elaborate exhaust manifold system I've seen on these World War II models, are so well engineered that they go together without any problems, and everything just locks into place as if it was magic. On the main drum over here, there is a two-piece assembly, so there is a small seam that you are gonna have to contend with. I strongly recommend pre-priming this component after the bodywork was done, just to make sure everything is thoroughly painted and the seams are removed. And by the way, the same is also going to be true for the large fuel canister that we have right here on the back. On the top fuel tank itself, you have to be very careful with how you remove the seams, because with the way the piece is molded, you do have these two ribs that are integrally molded on, so you want to be very careful with the sandpaper so you don't over polish it and delete these sections over here, which will definitely hurt the look. By the way, same is also true for the main exhaust manifold, but these ones here, the ribs are smaller and finely molded, so you really want to take extra care with the sanding. The other thing to mention is with the end section over here, the seam is definitely present, and you do have to be a little creative with your seam removal process because you're not exactly going to be able to get in there with some sandpaper to do the job. On the model here, I filled the area in with some super glue. Then once the super glue set, I took a Dremel with a small high-speed removal bit, and I was able to use the flat section found on the top portion as a way to just polish away the area over here, leaving for the appearance on this model. This technique is a somewhat risky technique if you don't have the experience or the, the practice with this type of a procedure, but if you get the experience down packed, you can really do some amazing things with a high speed removal bit. On the top portions, we have some spare track racks. One unit is empty, and the other unit has a little section of track installed. This was another aspect of the build that required a little bit of creativity in order to get fully painted, weathered, and fitted. On the track, I like to paint and weather them separately, and then secure them to the model, but on the Matilda here, it's a little tricky because of the retention strap. Obviously, once the straps are in place, you're not gonna be able to get the piece seated, and if you try to paint the piece off of the tank, you run the risk of there being a continuity error, and it won't match with the remainder of the weathering. Well, on this one here, I was able to paint and weather the strap off of the model, and have it blend in with the remainder of the weathering, and the track link itself was again painted off the model, and then everything was secured in place just before the tank was ready to be varnished over. The holes for the track racks are, again, a bit on the stiffer side, so it would 
help to open them up slightly with a Dremel bit on a pin vise. And, you know, once done, this makes the assembly go by much easier. The track just clipped directly into place with really no mods being needed to be made to the slot or the hole itself. Of course, on this area over here, the Matilda has a bunch of lights. We have the two main headlights, and then there are other running lights right here on the top portions. These are integrally molded on, so a simple swipe of silver paint was all that was required in order to complete the look. On the rear engine deck over here, you can really appreciate the details that Meng molded in, and Meng did a marvelous job with rendering out all of the details seen. This would include the air vents, the axis hatches to the engine, which are found on this area, as well as also on the very rear section of the rear deck. Moving upward to the tank's turret, again, an excellent engineered piece, and it has some really good geometry to it. On the turret itself, it is a multi-part assembly, so you will have a seam running along the back portion here, and this was simply polished away with the same super glue and sandpaper technique that I've touched upon many times already. The piece is nicely engineered where the top just locks directly in place, and it's completely seamless. The mantlet setup is also very nicely done. The piece does go up and down with ease. It's a little stiff with all the paint and the varnish added, but as you can see, you're not going to have to worry about the piece drooping on you. Both the main barrel and the coax barrel were drilled out with a Dremel just to give a little bit extra detailing to the model, as I often mention in these videos, and the same was done to the smoke grenade launchers as well. Of course, as of note on the real unit, the smoke grenade launchers are actually modified Lee and Field rifle receivers that have no stocks on them and have this giant tube section found on the front portion. For the model over here, I left it stock and I just simply painted the rear sections black and added some dry brushing. Same type of dry brushing, by the way, that was added to the MG along with the powder fouling found on both sections. Just like with many of the other World War II's models, the vehicle does have operational hatches, and on the Matilda here, they are very, very nicely engineered. On some of the other World War II's models I've done, the hinges are a bit chintzy, where, yeah, they hold the piece in place, they do operate, but they do run the risk of popping out of the hinge mechanism. With the Matilda here, the design's more robust, and so the hatches are just much more stronger in comparison. They are decently engineered and if you assemble them appropriately you'll have no problems getting the pieces to function. And that's it for the detailing. This takes to the paint and the markings and again on this build here I had to go outside my comfort level in order to paint outside of what I mentioned before with the masking of the tracks. You see with this type of camouflage pattern you really can't apply this via the airbrush. This is something that needs to be done in a different manner. Now some people would go ahead and use masks to mask up the surfaces so you get that nice crisp cut line on all these sections, but rather than going with that approach, I went ahead and just simply applied the entire camouflage and paint on this vehicle via the paintbrush. This is a technique that is definitely outside of my norm where generally I use the airbrush for basically all of my paintwork, but for this one here it is necessary because you're not going to be able to get these sharp edge cut lines with the airbrush method. So this model was also unique in that I didn't have a base coat. If we can recall this to those 172nd scale Merc pattern tanks that I've done or even the 135 Merc pattern tank that I've done, and also in the World War II's lineup, I did the Char B1 Bis, where that also received a paintbrush camo pattern. All of those I started with some sort of a base coat, either tan or green or, you know, whatever. However, on this one here, that wasn't the case because there was really no dominant color. Basically, each of the three colors found in this camouflage pattern are basically equivalent on their surface area. So to paint one, as a main base coat was just a waste of paint. So on this one here, what I went ahead and did was first the entire model was primed in flat black spray paint. Then the remainder of the paintwork was going to be done via the paintbrush. Of course, the bottom was airbrushed and so was the lower hull. This was all masked up during the, you know, the, the, at this point. But for the camo, the model was painted in flat black. Then 
the first color I used was the green. The green here is to me a black green. I've used it on a few other builds. It's a good color. It, it's really good for British vehicles. But the black green was applied. And I basically looked at some examples of this camo pattern and I, you know, mimicked it as the best I could. After the black green, the following color then was going to be the blue, which is also Tamiya, and this is light blue. Again, the same type of format. And then the final color was Tamiya Desert Tan. As I've mentioned in all of the videos where I have to hand paint something, if you're going to paint a model with a paintbrush, you have to do it the appropriate way because you can easily mess up when you try to paint a model exclusively via paintbrush. What's always a telltale sign that someone used a paintbrush to paint the model is with the consistency of the paint and also the quality of brush that was utilized. If you have either of those not set appropriately, you're going to have paint that's applied too thick and you're also going to be able to see clear brush strokes on the surface of the model, which will hurt the look. On this model here, if you look closely, or if the camera goes closely, you will not see a single evident sign of either of those. The paint is as flat as possible, and the brush strokes are non-existent. The brush I used was a good quality paintbrush that I had on hand. I picked it up from Hobby Lobby or Michaels a while ago. It's, you know, it's a good quality paintbrush, but the paint needs to be at just the right consistency. Fortunately, when you're using Tamiya, getting the appropriate consistency is really, really easy. The only thing I did was I just watered it down. What you do is you do not take the paint directly from the bottle and apply it to the model. That's just not going to work. That's how you get those mistakes I touched upon before. In order to apply it to the model, you take the paintbrush, you dip it in the paint, you add it to a uh, paint palette, and then with a drop, just take the brush, dip it in some water, and then you swirl the paint in the, in the palette. Once the paint is swirled in the palette, it's going to be much thinner compared to the consistency that was in the bottle, and at that point there, you can start applying the paint. The remainder of the paintwork was done via the airbrush and this would include the weathering and this was important to use the airbrush for this because the airbrush has a way of flattening everything out further and giving it a look that you really just can't mimic without the airbrush. The airbrush techniques would include counter shading, filtering, as well as washing. The other paintwork that you see here for the weathering was done via the dry brush method and that was a technique that I showcase on many of these videos, and that's how I get the scratch surfaces that you see on the model. For the vehicle's markings, the kit supply decals were utilized, and as I predicted in the unboxing portion, the quality of decals are excellent. They went on without any problems, and adhered even better once the VMS matte varnish was applied to all of the model surfaces. In the end, I couldn't be any happy in how this build turned out. In fact, I loved this build. These World War II models in general never disappoint with the enjoyment that I get when building them, but the Matilda here was probably one of my favorite builds in the lineup that I've done so far. The vehicle's choice is really cool, and the execution is excellently done, and on top of that, the Matilda itself is just a really, really cool tank. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite British tanks of all time. And this is the perfect point to springboard us into skill level and recommendations. Now, although the World War II's lineup of tanks are really, really simple, and this one here is, you know, much along the same lines, I will say that this is probably the hardest of the World War II's tanks that I've built thus far. Having said that, however, the thing is far from impossible for a beginner to tackle. And if a beginner can tackle one of these models, obviously so could the advanced and intermediate builders. For recommendations, well, like I've stated in all these World War II videos, if you're a fan of the video game, obviously this is going to be something that you're going to be very interested in. Another person who I recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of World War II armor, British armor, as well as armor from the North African campaign. Also, like I stated on the other... World War II's videos. This kit here I would recommend for anyone who is a youth builder and are looking to get into the hobby of plastic modeling, as well as also for a grandparent or a parent to find a 
project for them to work on together for either an afternoon or a weekend. Because these models are so easy to, relatively easy to put together, the costs are relatively low and the availability is relatively high, all of these factors make for a build and a build experience that is going to be very pleasurable for all parties involved. Another person who would appreciate this kit would be someone who's looking to purchase a gift for someone in their life. If someone knows a person who's an avid model builder and has a huge collection of models, but you're not really sure what to get them, well, any of the World War II models is something that either the person might not know of or might not necessarily have thought to add to their collection. But if it's gifted to them, chances are really good, they're really going to appreciate it and it's going to be something very unique to add to their collection. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to is anyone who has either of the Tamiya Matilda tanks and are looking to experiment with the camo and with the weathering. The Matilda is a vehicle that has a very unique set of camouflage patterns out there. There's about three or four different types of even the desert camo like the one we have here. And if you're looking to figure out which one would be best for your build or exactly how to go about doing it, instead of just, you know, going in and weighing it on the Tamiya kit that is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a bit on the pricier end, you can experiment and get the feel out on one of these World War Tunes kits. After building one or maybe two of these to figure out exactly what you're going to do with the camo and the weathering, you will be much better prepared to undertake the Tamiya kit and by the time you get to the Tamiya kit, chances are going to be really good. Your confidence and your skill sets are going to be much more improved and that build will go by a bit easier. One final person I would recommend this kit to is if someone is getting a bit bored with the same old, same old tank kits, like, you know, you've done 101 variants of the Panther, the Panzer IV, or the Sherman, and you're looking to try something a bit different. You want to stretch your legs out and add something unique and different to your collection. Well, all of the World War II tanks are another way to scratch that itch. They're really, really cool. They look different. They add a bit of spice to your collection. They're unique. And on top of that, they're just very pleasant to build. All in all, you can't go wrong with adding either one or, they tend to get addicting, all of the vehicles in the line to your collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this caricaturized British Matilda infantry tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Take care.